uh, we are starting the, the second day of the school with uh, the, the second lecture by Raphael. Raphael, please go on. Yes, thank you. All right, guys. Um, I think we stopped here when we constructed the, the first time in the effective action in the derivative expansion, remember, the spherical cow approximation. And uh, we started discussing about the new terms that we're going to add to incorporate the structure that lives in our what we call the UV physics on short scale that will account for the finite size effect. So we're going to go beyond the spherical cow approximation. I mentioned a little bit about how to include what you can call the dipole, the rotation, the spin, um, through a coupling to the angular velocity, like you will do, for example, in a Hamiltonian, uh, uh, like in first order, in a first order theory with a PQ dot term. So this is the same as a PQ dot term. S serves as a conjugate momentum associated with the angular yeah. velocity. And then you incorporate here a spin coupling to the Ricci rotation coefficients that would allow you to also couple spin now to the gravitational field. And this is very similar to the way that you will do it in the Dirac equation. And in fact, some historical remark here, the, the first correction to the spin interaction in a gravitational field, the classical spin corrections to the gravitational interaction in, and to the spin interaction in a gravitational field was computed in the 70s um, by Baker and O'Connell by essentially taking the Dirac equation and the levels, the, 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 the energy levels in the hydrogen atom and basically replacing the sigma matrix by the S. And this is justified because the coupling is essentially similar. At least in order, at least you get the right, uh, the right energy levels, I mean, at the classical level, which is kind of a historical remark. So this would allow us to incorporate spin. I'm not gonna talk about spin in the lectures because it will take me a lot of time. It's very subtle, as I mentioned as well, because you have too many degrees of freedom. So they, it, they, it's a gauge symmetry that basically transforms and rotates the spin. So you need to gauge fit this, as we determined before, that we are describing this guys in terms of Lorentz transformation. So this is a, a very cool story that I don't have much time to uh, talk about, but please ask me on Slack or, or I already mentioned my review where I discussed the spin at length, okay? So we're gonna start here, which is we're gonna give uh, the cow a quadruple. Now you might ask, what about a dipole term? Because what we're going to write here resembles a lot what you will do in electromagnetism. You will essentially say you will couple now you have a charged sphere, say. So the first term here will be the same. You will have a mass, but here you will have the charge coupled to the, uh, so you can write it here if you have an ENM term. So you could also add a charge coupled to the electric field that to the uh, uh, vector potential. This couple here will also resemble, for example, the leading order term that we get here from the BV coupled to the metric, as if that this is a one, index uh, field, this here we get uh, two index field and so on. So if you start correcting the charge sphere with the first corrections due to finite size, what can a charge sphere do? It can polarize, so it can have a dipole. Now think about how would you write this dipole in, in GR? Imagine if you had gravity and you had to uh, write this dipole, what would you write? And then think about why this guy is not there or what does he do or how does that term uh, looks like, okay? But we do the same in gravity. So now we have uh, something similar to the electric field. So we have the curvature field, uh, the curvature tensor, but we're going to do is the following. We're gonna remove all the traces and we'll see in a second why, as I wrote that here, why we're gonna take out the traces of the Riemann tensor. We're gonna work with the Weyl tensor. And then the Weyl tensor can be decomposed into the electric and magnetic components. And here I'm gonna concentrate on the electric part. So we write the electric component of the Weyl tensor which we can do because we took all the traces out. So this guy is traceless and it's orthogonal to the velocities. And then we write a coupling, a wall line coupling, which is some object that lives in the wall line, uh, this object here, which has two indices because this guy has two indices. It's in a local frame. So this A, E, A mu is a, is a locally flat frame. So we're gonna define this object in the, in the free falling frame. So we don't have to uh, worry about transforming between fields uh, and, and then think about this object as if we were in a special relativity. So we can think about this object the same way you will think about some deformation in the, in the frame in which this object is, uh, is free falling. And here we're gonna couple this guy. Uh, we're gonna couple this guy only, only to the long part of the, uh, of the gravitational field as we discussed earlier. Right, so the physics, 
the physics is only the long gravitational field, okay? So all the short modes, even the short modes of the gravitational field, and this is part of the cool, I mean, if you were doing Newtonian, you would do exactly the same. If you were doing Newtonian here, you would not have this Riemann tensor. What you have is a, is a gravitational potential. And then you just take two derivatives of the gravitational potential, and then you get this field. And you couple two derivatives of the gravitational potential to some object which has, has two indices, and that would be your quadruple. So it's nothing very fancy. The, 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 the interesting aspect of this is that this is GR, it's a fully nonlinear theory, and this decomposition also applies here, in which also the, the um, gravitational field will dress up this quadruple. This object will be also dressed by the short distance gravitational modes. And this will be very important later when we use the same theory to describe the binary, because those short distance modes will also include the binding energy that will also radiate. Okay, so this separation will be very useful later on as well to describe the radiation from the binary. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this here, unfortunately, because it's also a beautiful story. And there is a, a, a way to include also these fields, which could be time dependent in principle. And if we include the time dependence of these fields, we can also include the dynamical deformation of the horizon. And we can have also that this theory dissipates. You can have unitarity going into these degrees of freedom. So you can lose energy into like the quasi normal modes, excitations, and so on. So you can start, you can start studying correlations of this field. You can start studying, for example, Q, 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 da, 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 correlations of this field. And those could incorporate also the physics of the quasi normal mode. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that, but it's a beautiful story as well, which is also very much constrained by symmetries, how these guys transform in terms of the internal indices and the rotations in the local frame, okay? So I'm not gonna talk about that, but there's a beautiful story here that uh, you can please ask me later if you wanna uh, learn more. So we have this object, it's coupled to the uh, electric field. And the question that you might ask uh, right away, well, okay, why the wall tensor? I will tell you in a second. And the other question is, uh, why do these fields describe? So naturally, I think if you think about Newtonian, this E mu nu here, if it, this is the curvature and you go to the Newtonian limit, you remember that there is a, oh, sorry. There's here, there will be an A00 IJ component. This A00 will carry the potential. So it will be exactly DI, DJ of the potential. And this Q will naturally incorporate the Newtonian quadruple. But as I was trying to tell you, there is more, okay? So this is what we're going to explore. How are we gonna describe who, what physics do this QAB uh, couplings uh, describe? And as I said, I'm not gonna talk about absorption uh, for now. Okay, so question number one is, why the white uh, the vial tensor why we don't couple this to riemann to the full riemann tensor and the, what happens here is that we are removing the traces so that, that's what the vial tensor does so you remove the traces what does that mean well in principle here this guy because it's, it's symmetric and trace free we are basically removing the traces of this guy of the quadruples it will be symmetric and trace free so what happens then to the traces that means that you you could in principle have a term in your, in your world and action that is proportional to the uh, Ricci curvature. Why don't we just add here, in, in here, why don't we just add a term like this? Just curvature uh, detail, just the scalar curvature. Because in principle, nothing prevents us here from this, uh, from these operators that we write here to be uh, proportional to the Ricci um, scalar. Or another term that we can write down uh, would, could be proportional to this guy, to the Ricci tensor contracted with the velocity. Nothing prevents you from writing those terms. In fact, if we were doing quantum mechanics, we will write these terms. In fact, if we were doing cosmology, if we were studying a fluid, so it would take the continual limit of this theory, we will also need these terms, as you will see in a second. But for the binary case where these guys are far apart, we do not need these terms. And how so? Well, if you think about um, this operator, this term in the action, and you think about the equations, the, the Einstein equations that we get from our theory, our theory so far is a theory of pole like objects. Uh, where's our, our action? Our pole like objects here, this is uh, this sigma, right? So if I write this in the bulk, it's a delta function interaction. So my t mu nu is proportional to a delta function. This is my leading order in the derivative expansion. So the equations of motion that we get in our theory are um, g mu nu, but essentially you can get r mu nu and r, right? So proportional to t mu nu if you put it on their side, t mu nu and the trace. 
which is proportional to uh, the delta function. So that means that either R or R mu nu, both on the wall line, right? Because it's a delta function, they blow up. Or are zero everywhere because this is a delta function. So this operator is either zero everywhere or on top of the particle, it blows up because you basically put it on top of the wall line, okay? So what this is telling us, essentially, from the field theory point of view, is it's just a pure counter term. On the wall line, it would be just a pure infinity. In fact, if you're doing dimensional regularization, you don't even see this guy. So how can you remove it from the physics? Well, what happens is something that we do all the time in effective field theory. So we do what is called a field redefinition. So we redefine our metric field. So we take our bulk action, which is here, the Einstein-Hilbert action, and we assume it's Einstein-Hilbert uh, for the long distance physics. Remember, I don't care what is the short distance. Maybe here I should emphasize that. So we make this clear because this is a very important distinction that will also allow us to use this theory even if we have a modification of Einstein gravity on short scale in vacuum. Even if in short scale you have vacuum, you have no matter, but the metric degrees of freedom obey a different theory. They are just a modification of gravity. We can still apply this because the long distance physics, the long distance theory still is uh, um, well approximated by GR or maybe higher derivative corrections here that are suppressed by another uh, uh, higher scale. Okay, so this is long. Let's uh, uh, make that clear. Okay, and we made a redefinition of this field. What does it mean to make a field redefinition? Well, making a field redefinition means that any observable should not depend on how or which coordinates, if you want. This is not really a coordinate transformation, but you can think about it as a coordinate transformation. So it's really a change on the field that we put if you want, it, if you're thinking about a path integral. When we integrate over the field, it doesn't matter if we do a, a transformation of the field, like you do G plus a constant. We do that all the time in the path integral and field theory. We can do the same here. The physics, there is an equivalent theorem that you might have heard of. The physics, the actual physics is invariant. So if you remember even the, 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 the LSE reduction, so you could have an overall wave function randomization, but it cancels out at the end, or everything is invariant. So the physics is invariant, we can do this transformation. And if you do a transformation that is localized on the wall line, it's very easy to see because the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action is proportional to the equations of motion, that if you take this guy to be precisely proportional to the trace, so proportional to Jimmy Nu, so you pick up the trace here, so you pick up the trace here, then you can remove this operator from your wall line theory. You can do exactly the same with this guy. So the moral of the story, which is the same that we do in any effective field theory, if you have higher derivative operators, which vanish on shell, they can be removed by uh, uh, via field redefinitions from all the observables on the theory. And this will simplify our life because it means that we can take just electric and magnetic components of the vial tensor instead of taking the full curvature field because we can get rid of all these traces. Now, what happens, there, but there's a catch, right? You have to also do the transformation on the wall line terms or in the high derivative terms as well. In, in, a, in a field theory, in a four dimensional field theory, what happens is that the, the variation of the fields on the operators is usually high derivatives, and then you generate another operator, which is already there anyway. So you just change the, the Wilson coefficient, you shift it by something. So it doesn't really matter. You remove one lower dimensional operator and you just shift it into a higher dimensional operator that your theory has in any case. So how does that look like here? Well, the difference here is that when you do a field redefinition in this, in, in the wall line term, which is the, the MD tau term or the, the CRDT term, you are gonna generate something which is uh, very similar to what is called the Darwin term in quantum mechanics. You generate a delta function because now the operation of the, uh, of the field redefinition is proportional to the delta itself, and on the wall line you have another delta, so you end up with a delta of x1 minus x2. And if you are doing quantum mechanics, this is, by the way, precisely the Darwin term that gives you the, the delta on the origin, which uh, shifts the energy of the lower energy uh, um, in the hydrogen atom, right, that you've heard about in, in the relativistic corrections. So there will be something very similar to a Darwin term. Or if we're doing a continuum theory, if we're doing a continuum theory, then these guys are on top of each other. These are densities, and therefore this could survive. But for the binary, since these guys are far apart, 
these type of effects are, are zero. They're never on top of each other. And therefore, and we also have a regime in which we don't allow them to be on top of each other. And therefore, therefore, we can remove them. So this is beautiful because now we know that we can just write this operator that couples our quadrupole to the electric component of the vial tensor, which does not include any traces. And therefore, we have traceless and, or, uh, and perpendicular to the velocity. Okay. So what we need to know now is that who is this guy? Who is this uh, QAD? Okay, so we're gonna study now uh, the two possibilities. If you have a, a body, right, in, in an external uh, gravitational background, which is what we're studying, then this body could have a quadrupole to begin with, just because if you compute, say, the expectation value of this operator or this QAB uh, field, if you wanna think about it as a field on the wall line, on the, on the short modes, on all the gravitational fields, on short scales, all the particles inside the neutron star that are having also interactions through QCD, electromagnetic, and so on, that object could come out to be non-zero. You could have a quadruple that is already there without the perturbation, without having a companion. So these are the expectation values in what you would call the short modes. I will see an example in a second of how can that happen. The other thing that can happen and also happens in electrodynamics is that there is a response. Because there is a perturbation, this guy could just deform. And because it deforms, it generates a quadruple just because you're squeezing it with the companion. Yeah. And this we call the response. Sorry, I should cut off the email. And this is, this is the response. So we can have, an expectation value on the short modes that would be like a permanent quadrupole that is there to begin with, or we can have a quadrupole that is induced by the perturbation because the object is otherwise spherically symmetric, for example, in isolation, okay? So what are the two, exam the two typical examples of these two uh, things? Um, so you can have a permanent quadrupole, for example, if you are rotating. In fact, you know this for a curved black hole in GR. You know the curved black hole has a quadrupole that is proportional to the square of the spin. And that means that because this hole is rotating, it oblates, and then it basically deforms. And if you look at the curve metric, you'll see that there is a component of the curve metric that looks like there is a quadrupolar uh, contribution. You can even look at it very, very far away. It will be like a Newtonian quadrupole. And then we know, you can do the match in this way, as I'll show you in a second. And then you'll know that there is a permanent quadrupole that is induced by the spin. And this means that this QAB on the short modes could be described by the spin. And here's an example of an operator that you can write down in your action, which is proportional to the spin square, which is this quadruple term. And it has a coefficient, which will depend on the UV physics, it will depend on what object you have. If you have a curved black hole, it turns out that this coefficient is one because the quadruple is exactly a square gram. But if you have another object, like a star, a rotating star, this object could vary. It could be four, 10. It would be a number that would depend on the equation state of uh, the compact object. But for a black hole, it's one. And this is very interesting because a lot of people have also discussed this, that this is one test that you can do of uh, GR on short scales is to prove precisely that if you look at the waveforms and that you look at the imprint of the short modes of the quadrupole of the spin-induced contribution, that this is exactly one, that when you do a posterior probability distribution for this parameter, that is around one, if you establish that the mass, for, for example, is larger than a neutron star, and then you think it's a black hole. And therefore, this is something that we could do. And in fact, if we have an environment around a black hole like this, for example, this axial light particle, they could also change the value of this uh, parameter. In fact, it can, it can change by a lot. And this could be another way in we can study the possibility that you have a condensate of light particles around black holes that are produced by super radiance because of the curved black hole uh, produces a super radiance stability. If you have a seed of a very light particle that has to be longer the wavelength than the typical Schwarzschild radius. And therefore this number could also be a window into this uh, uh, new sector of very light particles, okay? So this is one way in which this quadruple will contrib contribute. Notice that because this Q is proportional to the spin, and then we have here the electric field coupling, this contributes to the one-point function. So 
this guy will start at order h if you're doing a perturbation in the metric g eta plus h right and therefore it contributes to the one point function and this is what we expect to be because there is a quadruple deformation in the curve metric okay but notice something very interesting which is because this is symmetric and trace free if this qab was symmetric and trace free right so if you look at the at the delta chronicle contribution that vanishes then you don't get contributions to the one point function and this we expect to be so actually this this cancellation that we discuss here this cancellation that we discuss here sorry is reminiscent of the birkhoff theorem if these traces had contribute if this guy had contributed it would have contributed to the one point function if this guy would have contributed it would have contributed to the one point function and we know that an isolated spheric a spherically symmetric solution of einstein's equations just has the mass does not have these coefficients this cr or that's another cv here okay so that's also a manifestation of the fact that the one point function does not want any of these terms and it's precisely how you do how does they transform away through this field of definition. So that is essentially a manifestation of Birkhoff theorem. But for the Kerr solution, we know there is a quadruple and therefore it's described by this operator. Very good, let's keep going. So what about the response? Uh, uh, Rafael, sorry, there is a question by, by Sasa in the chat window. Oh, by uh, Sasa. Are there any bounds on uh, this coefficient C? Ah, that's an excellent question. So we think, and we'll see it in a second also for the tidal love number, we think that they are bound from below, right? But we don't really have, this is observational or computational, if you want. When you take a star and you calculate these numbers and then you take the curl limit, and then you see that the curl limit is essentially the lowest you can get. And for the love number, the same will happen. As you reduce the compactness of the star, when you, you have to assume some equation stay, like some polytropic equation stay for the neutron star. And as you reduce the compactness, you make the star to be or the other you, 2gm for the radius, then you will tend to the value of the of the Schwarzschild black hole or the Kerr black hole. So the, there seems to be a, a, a trend of a lower bound. But we, and I thought about this also with the way that Sasha thinks about these operators for a long time, I've been thinking about how can we write maybe a dispersion relation or some causality bound or something that will tell us that this is indeed the case, that there is a lower bound. So far, I have not been able to come out with a, with a convincing argument, but you will see how it could be done, how one could, in principle, attack this problem. But this is an excellent question. So in principle, we think this is the minimum number you can get. We cannot have a star that can do less than this, but this is a very interesting question. So the response will take me in a second to the love number, right? Because now if we have a response, so if we put this guy, so uh, by the way, the, what I just said, I just repeat it here. If it's spherically symmetric in isolation, so this guy will be proportional to a delta function, well, you have to symmetrize it and take the trace out, but it will be delta minus a third. And, and um, um, so this guy does not contribute because if he couples to the E mu nu and he couples to the trace, the trace of the vital tensor is zero, we remove all those traces as we determine and therefore, there is no CR or CV in the Schwarzschild metric. They're all gone. We're all happy. If the object is spherically symmetric in isolation, there is no short mode contribution. Okay. Couple to symmetric trace free e, e, um, projected EAB projected on the local frame and this one. And as I said, this is because now the response is another story because we can generate a quadruple if the object is deformed. You can deform in principle, you can deform a black hole and induce a quadruple because we have done this in electromagnetism all the time. It's down here to here. This is the same <clears throat> as the electromagnetic susceptibility. If you have an external electric field on a charged sphere, positive field uh, charges will go up, negative uh, charges will go down you will generate a dipole. And the proportionality, and this could be time dependent, by the way, as often you go to frequency space. So this guy could be dependent on the frequency. The susceptibility of certain materials depends on the frequency. In the uh, static limit, in the limit in which you turn on the field, the charges go up and down, and they, then you, you slowly go to zero frequency limit when you just leave this guy as a static field. And in that limit, uh, the static uh, susceptibility, 
um, is what resembles now the same that we're gonna get here with the so-called tidal love number. This will be the static uh, electromagnetic susceptibility. In gravity, it's exactly the same. It will be proportional to our electric field. Our electric field is this two index object, this electric component of the vial tensor. This guy has two objects, so the quadruple will be proportional to two derivatives of our field, two derivatives of the metric perturbation is this electric field. And the proportionality factor in the limit in which we go to the zero frequency limit, because this is a number. So we are basically saying this resembles the zero frequency limit. Because if we put frequency here, what's gonna happen is that here there will be another other terms that could depend on the dot. So more omegas, if we had omegas here, these omegas will, res will result in dots. So we can have higher derivative terms in a derivative expansion, but that derivative expansion, again, this dot is suppressed because in the, in the long wavelength limit, in the small frequency approximation, these guys are suppressed. So the leading order term for us, we now have derivatives, will be the static contribution. So we know in principle, oh, sh shoot, this is too big, anyway. So in principle, there are derivative corrections as well, but we're not gonna include all those derivative corrections. There's a full function that it could be the CE, could be a full function of the frequency. We're looking at the first correction, which is in the static limit. And this is just linear response theory, by the way. There is nothing fancy here. This is linear response theory of the QE coupling. Are we looking at how the Q responds to E when there is a linear coupling between Q and some external field? Right, so this, this CE will come out if you want of the Green's functions of the Q. So this is typ typical linear response theory, but as we know from electromagnetism, which by the way, this is also where we study linear response theory, we do the same, right? Um, the static limit is our guy. What we're really studying is the fact that as you turn on the gravitational field and then you leave it, uh, let it rest and you go to the static limit, this guy will be deformed in the presence of, of some, for example, gravitational potential with two derivatives. Uh, if, if you have a gradient, a second derivative gradient, uh, therefore you're gonna have a quadrupole and this guy will deform as we see here. And that proportionality is the tidal love number, okay? And why am I repeating all this about Newtonian and so on? It's because it's called love not because we love this and not, and, and yes, we love this, but not, that's not the reason, right? The reason is because some guy called HS, I think it was HS, love in the 1700s was studying this okay obviously he didn't have gr but he did know about taking two derivatives of a potential and this co uh, coefficient of uh, proportionality was precisely what he called i don't think he called it love because that would be kind of like um, uh, too much uh, about himself but uh, uh, somebody maybe later call it love but that's why we call it love okay and this is the generalization of that idea to uh, gr which means now we're studying this uh, in terms of this object, which is a, a, a wall line field. And this is the electric component of the vial tensor because we are in general relativity. And this coefficient is our tidal love number. In the post-Newtonian approximation, as I told you before, these omegas will end up in dots and dots will call us, will cause us velocity. So the static limit in the static response, this will be the first term, the first term that will uh, modify the dynamics and it will be the first term that captures UV physics in our theory. Remember, this will be another one if the guys are rapidly rotating. But if the, guy, if the guys are not rotating, that like we think, for example, neutron stars are not very rapidly rotating, this is the way we learn about the equation of state of neutron star. This is the way that LIGO put bounds on the equation of state of neutron star, studying precisely this, this guy, this love number. So let's assume for now that there is no rotation and this is what we're after, okay? And as I said, this is the same as in e &M, and this is answering Sasha's questions. I thought a lot about this, but I didn't come up with a, with a, um, it, the analogy that fails because of the UV properties of the theory. So we know, for example, this kramer kronner relationships. We know that the real part of the susceptibility has to be there. It's not zero if we get absorption. Because the real and imaginary part are related by the kramer kronner relationships, and we know that this guy, um, we have some positivity argument that we can run in terms of cross sections and so on, like in dispersion relations associated with the kramer kronner uh, uh, relations. 
And then we know how those two guys are related. And then we will know that there will be a non-zero real power just for, because the integral of the imaginary power on the right-hand side that would be positive, And therefore we have a positive susceptibility. This kind of is the bound that you're after. We are saying if the guy's deformed because it's absorbing, when you take that to the small frequency limit, it will end up with some dipole. And we know it has to end up with a dipole. In, we know that this guy is there. So you naively think that we will have a way to put a bound here. However, we don't quite understand the analytic properties of this theory or in GR uh, cross sections and so on to actually say how the UV properties are so they allow us to close the contours to run these Kramer corner relationships and so on. Whether you need what is called subtractions, etc. You will need to make a lot of assumptions to be able to run something like this. But it's a very interesting question that uh, some people have also looked at. Now, because the response looks like this and it's the static response, we can go back and put it in the action. So in the Wolman theory, what this means, and by the way, we could have started here, uh, assuming that um, we have the formophism invariant and the long distance theory, and you assume that the object is spherically symmetric in isolation. So the only terms that you can write down in that case will be this guy. So it will be quadratic in the electric field, the same way that the susceptibility will give you a term quadratic in the field, but it's nice to see in this analysis where it's actually coming from. What is the CE coefficient? This CE coefficient is nothing but the linear response of the electric field, the electric uh, vital tensor field perturbing the object, the compact object, the response proportion to the field itself. And in fact, this is one way in which you can match, as we'll see in a second, how can you read off this number? Well, I just put a star in a field and see how it deforms by looking at the field far away. And by reading the field far away, you will know how this quadruple depends on the standard structure. Because the boundary conditions, when you solve the full equations, will know about what's happening inside. The same way that you find the solutions outside of star by, bound, by putting boundary conditions on the surface, right? And that's the way we will know about the equation state. How that affects the field far away will be through the boundary conditions. How this field affects the field far away is by generating a quadruple. But all this is different variant. And, and the nice thing about GR is that we can maybe ask this question in an engaging variant way because doing what I just described to you is very Newtonian. We need coordinates to tell you I'm far away, I have a quadruple, I have some boundary conditions. To do that calculation, I need coordinates. This, this operator is coordinate independent. And then I'm going to bring here one issue that has uh, been a puzzle for us in, during the last years that uh, we haven't yet fully resolved, and I'll tell you why. And this is one way in which we can fully resolve this issue, OK? But before I get to that, let me just uh, um, mention the following. The following, uh, uh, what I want to say is the following. If the, the guy is not rotating, and we know it's a black hole, this is the only way we can distinguish it from a point particle but, uh, uh, from any other object, because the leading order term in our derivative expansion is m. The only way we can tell whether it's a black hole or something else, if it's more than, say, three solar masses, is because this coefficient we can compute for GR and then see what comes out. And we can compute for other objects and see what comes out. And if it comes out as in the GR case or it's another object, we have a handle into what, what this object was. So we have now, if we know spin, two coefficients. One is the mass that we have to match as well. The other one is this coefficient that know about the UV scale. So now we need to get them from somewhere. And that's the matching that I'm being alluding to. We need to do a matching into the full theory to know what these coefficients are. But notice something. This operator here has four derivatives because this has two and this has two. So this has four derivatives. This is too many derivatives. And in fact, we knew that it will be too many derivatives. It's not like an E and M that you have a dipole. Here we have a quadrupole. And the reason we have a quadrupole is the equivalence principle that you know that you can get rid of first derivatives. So the second derivative is the one that starts kicking in, right? And then you have a quadratic response in, in the action, because these guys are in isolation, they're spherically symmetric, so you have a coupling to a quadrupole, but the coupling itself of the quadrupole is also proportional to the field, so you get field square. So this means that it's gonna cost you a lot of derivatives, it's gonna cost us a lot in this expansion, in this post-Newtonian expansion. And this is why a lot of people are motivated and excited about going to high precision in the post-Newtonian expansion, is precisely to have a control at the same order at which this coefficient first starts in the waveforms, to be able to tell objects apart from whether it's a black hole, 
whether it's a neutral star, if it, the black hole is very light, or if it's a new object, or if we have these ultra light particles that I was uh, telling you about. So this is the way that an effective field theorist learns about new physics. And we need to now, now do the matching to know what those coefficients are. But notice that we parameterize the influence completely generically in the long distance universe uh, theory. It has to take this form. We know, sorry, we know, oh, I have color. We know that it has to take this form. So we know the imprint in the waveforms already. We might not know what the value is, but we know how it's gonna look like because we can calculate this, okay? So now comes the fun part. The fun part is that in the effective theory, the scale R is gone. The scale uh, uh, big R, the, the UV physics, is all hidden here in this C coefficient. But in the full theory, it's, it's not true. The full theory, there is the full scale R, like the Schwarzschild radius, for example, in the uh, Schwarzschild solution and so on. So these two have to be the same in the uh, long wavelength uh, expansion, which means in an expansion of big R over small uh, 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 over the long wavelength lambda, which is smaller than one, these two things have to be the same, which means we have to keep in our derivative expansion here up to whichever order we're gonna go in comparison with the full theory. And this is how effective field theory works. This is why we also change our paradigm about how we think about physics, like, like pre, I don't know, Wilson, right? In terms of thinking about, oh, the series is non-renormalizable. Or, or we have all this tower of high dimensional operators, it's infinite. So how do we cut it off? Well, it's the power counting. You tell me how accurately you're gonna measure something. We know the coupling, we know how to write the, because of the symmetries of the long distance universe, we know how to write these operators. It will be up to just numbers, just coefficients that we need to match. And we know how to power count at which order each one enters. And you tell me how accurate you want to do a measurement, and I tell you how many times you need to keep, okay? And this is our paradigm too. We don't need to know exactly the UV physics, we just need to read off these coefficients. And this simplifies our lives uh, tremendously. In particular, imagine trying to solve GR equations with the full equations for whatever is happening inside a neutron star. It will be impossible. Of course, when you get very close and near to merge, you need to input all that information in simulations and so on. But if you had to do the same with that far away, you will go crazy. This is a very simple and economic way to parameterize all that is happening inside the neutron star in a derivative expansion in terms of just a bunch of numbers. So this is an organ organizational principle. It's an educational way to do this dimensional analysis that you will expect uh, naively also from the power company, okay? So we need to do this matching to read these coefficients. And I'm concentrating here in non-spinning case, just mass and um, the tidal love number, okay? This fact that it has too many derivatives, it will come back to hit us later. Now, I was asked, I think, in, this, in the Slack chat uh, about the mass already. How does this match the, the metric, the Schwarzschild solution? Well, this is one way in which you can match the mass. Because, by the way, this m that appears in my theory is not the sum of the masses, right? It's the m that I need to match with the full theory. And if I have a compact object of mass m, the mass m of the compact object is not the sum of the masses. There is a lot of binding, otherwise this will just fly apart, right? The, the object itself is a bunch of binaries, triples and whatever, themselves, okay? So whatever m comes in there has to be the whole binding energy combined and, and all the particles, et cetera, that form the object that give you this parameter m that we call the mass. But how can we match this mass? Well. We go into the effective theory. Remember, even if you are in Schwarzschild, our source is a delta function. And by the way, this, this, um, this really bothers relativists because you cannot, and they will tell you, and there's a famous paper by some Robert Genoch where he showed, I think even strings is, is kind of, I don't remember now if strings are possible, um, but certainly delta functions, localized pawn like objects are not. This is the linearized theory, right? This is box H equal delta. This is, this is G mu nu equal T mu nu, linearized, okay? In harmonic gauge, I'm choosing a gauge. Um, but if you're doing GR and you had a T mu nu that is a delta, there are nonlinear iterations of this, a higher orders. So here, obviously I have plus order H squared. And if I H squared deltas, I obviously run into divergences. And even as distributions, this guy get off proof that this doesn't make any sense. So you cannot have delta functions. And we know that the Schwarzschild solution is not a solution of R mu nu equal delta, it's R mu nu equals zero, 
right? How come are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because even if we run into divergences in my theory, I don't care. I don't care because it's an effective theory. And the fact that theory is supposed to know about the long distance physics, but not about the short distance modes. And it could run into divergences because we are changing the way that the field goes into the UV by putting these high derivative terms. But in the, in the UV, this theory has nothing to do. So we can add counter terms to remove all these divergences. And that's what we do with effective field theory. That's exactly what effective field theory does. I don't care that the theory is non randomizable I don't care that I'm screwing badly the UV by adding these high dimensional operators. Is because I can always add counter terms because these coefficients I need to match to the full theory anyway. So I can put minus cut off piece that it was going to cancel the large part and whatever is left over that's just match. And as long as the, after I remove the cutoff, I have a well defined derivative expansion and power counting, everybody's happy. And that's why dimensional regularization is so useful because it takes care of this power counting for you. You don't mix the scales with having a cutoff that makes your life really difficult. Okay. So dim reg is nice in that, but then you have to remove this operator, this, this heavy scales by hand and constructing the effective theory like we did here by writing this affected uh, high dimensional operator. So if there are divergences with the delta functions when we start iterating, I don't care. In fact, we're going to have logarithmic divergences. And it's going to be beautiful because those log divergences are good. They're not bad. They're beautiful because they're going to give me running. This guy is going to have an RG flow. OK? Not quite this guy, but similar guys. Uh, you will see what I mean here. Uh, so you have logarithm divergences or, because there will be logarithms of R of the, of, the use, the, of the short scale that will be attached to the logarithm of omega in the long distance universe. So there'll be a logarithm of R over omega, say. For the binary, this is going to be beautiful because a logarithm of R over omega is going to be a log of V. And they will be in the binary log of Vs. So there will be a beautiful renormalization theory of the binary theory which unfortunately, I don't know if I'm going to get at, I'll try, in which we resum all these logarithms of the velocity. In fact, there is a logarithm that resembles a lot what happens in, in the hydrogen atom with the lamp shift, which is the famous beta logarithm. So there will be something very similar here. And the fact is, you will naturally account for that through the RG flow. So that's very nice as well. So don't be afraid of the divergences. Um, because if you're a relativist, if you're a relativist and you wonder, uh, that's okay. And if you wonder um, what these deltas are doing with the theory is not well defined, blah, blah, blah. Remember, we're in an effective theory, so that should be fine. Uh, very good. So forget about for now this, uh, um, this high uh, order terms or these nonlinear terms. We compute the one point function in our effective theory that could be discovering a black hole. Remember, again, I'm putting the short distance geometry in here, right? And I get something far away. 2gm over r, I far away, r much, much bigger than gm. The effective theory matches into the full theory. The full theory is an isolated by Holly Schwarzschild. So the Schwarzschild guy, we have far away a solution. Well, if it's a compact Gauge, it would be Timinu. If it's zero, it would be Schwarzschild. It would be far away something. And remember something beautiful here, right? We have scale invariance in the Einstein's equation, that means you equal zero. Where did this m come from? What broke the, the scaling symmetry, right? And how this guy came out, it did not come out of, of M delta. It did not come out of the M here in my assuming in the effective theory, right? It came out of some integration constant because G has units, okay? And this is also a beautiful story. I don't have time uh, to go through. Where did this guy uh, really, where the scale symmetries uh, uh, come from the breaking? Anyway, but the cool thing is that if you have a compact object, we have a Timinu, this M includes the binding. You compare the metric far away, you compare, in the effective theory, you match, and those two things should be the same. That's what the matching is about. You know the full theory. This is the answer in the effective theory. You look in the derivative expansion. You match, we get this. And the cool thing is that these are not necessarily the sum of the masses. And this will be very important for us because this will include uh, the binding. And if you think about the compact object here as the binding itself, this will be very natural that this M here will include the binding, and therefore this M will also include the binding of the binary system, OK? And now very briefly, because otherwise I'm going to run completely out of time, what about black holes where t mu is 0? Notice that effective theory has a non-zero t mu, as I just uh, described a second ago. But what we did was, OK, we have the long modes over here. We have the short modes of the g mu equals 0 equation. On the right-hand side now, we match that into a wall-line local theory. We also 
the, the decoupling of these guys into a wall line local theory. And that is what gave us this coupling here. Even though in principle, there was no team in U in the full theory. But through the matching, this M will match into the full Schwarzschild solution. And that's where the M is going to come into place. OK? And I don't have time to go into where the scaling variance, uh, uh, where did it go? But that's a very interesting question. OK? So the M EFT also matches into short distance geometry, which we know it happens anyway. Even Newtonian energy, OK, is tiny. This, this star is not held together um, well, by, by gravity it does in terms of the pressure canceling gravity and so on, but it's a fully uh, GR, right? But if you had an object and, and you try to bind this object just with gravity, you are in trouble, right? But the binding energy of the gravitational field is still there, right? Even though in an atom, the electromagnetic field is the most important, the gravitational force is still there. And therefore the binding will also be corrected by the gravitational potential. So even Newtonian physics will tell you that this is not the same as the sum of the masses, right? So, but this is very interesting because it will give us the matching for the binary later on when the gravitational field is the most important. So for the quadrupole, we can do the same. We can do as I just told you. The difference will be if you have here an, a quadrupole in, uh, in the short, uh, in the expectation value on the short modes, like the spin square uh, quadrupole, you look far away in both cases, you get a quadrupole that is proportional to the spin square in the Kerr solution. You get a quadrupole correction in the effective theory, like even if you had the Newtonian potential, the zero, zero component and so on, and then you match. And that's how you get, for example, that the CE square coefficient for Kerr is one. Or for a star, you just study what the field is far away. You have to match the solution through the horizon, through the, the, the surface. And that will give you information about the equation state of the neutron star, for example. Okay, but if you have the response part, the CE coefficient, you can also do it this way. You can also do the same. You can try to match far away the metric field, assuming that you put the guy in some external field, what would be now the response? However, one of the issues with this calculation that it has been done, and I'm gonna tell you the answer. One of the issues with this calculation is that it depends on the coordinates. And then some people complain that maybe the answers that you're getting are coordinate dependent. How do you know that the answer did not depend on that the choice of coordinates that you made to solve the equation? For example, the Tukowski equation, if you were doing a black hole. And then you put boundary conditions and infinity when you have growing modes, right? Because then there's an electric field outside. The, the, the way to overcome this problem of the coordinates would be to realize that our operator is stiff invariant. Our guy is a diffeomorphism invariant way to parameterize the tidal deformation of an object, which is very useful because if you just define it as, as, as this, and then you start taking derivatives, you have to tell me derivatives with respect to what, and which coordinates you're using then to compute the quadrupole that is induced and to match. Of course, you have to use the same coordinates and so on. But why you can get confused is because it so happened that when you do the matching, when you do the matching this way, you find, uh, I'll tell you in a second uh, how this works, but you find actually that the total love number of black holes vanishes. That is zero. And this is one reason that if you compute the quadruple far away, you get that there is no contribution very far away. The horizon deforms, but, but um, somehow when you look at the whole space time QAB deformation, of a black hole in an external universe, when it has a growing mode outside, uh, far away at infinity, that the QAV vanishes, that there is no total love number. And that's one of the reasons why people get confused or why this, this answer depends on the choice of coordinate. But one way in which we can do that is in a different variant way is by asking gauge invariant questions. And I'll show you in a second how we can do that. But before, I just wanted to advertise something that we will do uh, later when we study the binary. Instead of doing this, for the quadrupole, um, because we're gonna have to do all the moments, not just the quadrupole, the octopole, the 60 pole, et cetera, et cetera. It may be more useful, instead of matching the cues, to match the T minu right away. We could, in principle, take the one point function, as I just described, this is exactly what it means, right? This is the one point function, this is the one point function, and so on. And match the full T minu of my effective theory. 
because if we know the full the timinu and you take moments of that timinu we can get all the um the quadrupole the octopole etc we will have to do some group theory to decompose this into reducible representations and i'll show you how to do that but once we have this guy we can get all the moments and therefore if we have for example a quadrupole in in isolation which the binary by the way will have a quadrupole in isolation which we will have to compute to get the fluxes then this will be the most efficient way to do it we're not going to take the binary and put it in an external field for example or study the field of the binary far away we're going to look inside the binary by matching the team in and computing moments this is going to be much more useful but if you have an isolated object like a star it could be useful to solve the equations far away to match to the surface and do this calculation to get the response and this is what people have done for neutron stars the log number of a neutron star is a number in fact it's a somewhat large number in in, in natural units in, in in gm units it's about like 300 400 and so on so there is a number that you can calculate and in fact as you take the compactness uh, answering uh, the, the 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 question that sasha asked i mean at the beginning as you take the compactness of the star going to 2gm this starts to vanish so this is how people start looking at this calculation and say oh what's happening here i'm taking the compactness to the the black hole limit and this number is disappears and people had done the calculation for the black hole case and also found it zero independently solving the Tchaikovsky equation so this is clearly telling us something about this this response and and i'll tell you uh, now how we can calculate it um without using coordinates how would you, you do this without using coordinates? i just want to advertise this because we will do this for the binary when we do the matching for the binary it will be very useful to match the team you know. okay and we'll see how to do that but for the response of the love number if we're going to get rid of this problem of gauge dependence of the coordinates that we need to choose to solve our equation we can just do scattering and in fact this is what people the the the, the new way to think about um, gauge invariant questions in gravity or in, in particle physics is through uh, gauge invariant uh, objects, which is like an amplitude. And here you can do the same. You can scatter in off a black hole, study the scattering cross section. In fact, absorption, we did absorption this way. The correlators of the QQ, th correlators of the Q theory of the Wolland theory, they could have imaginary parts because you can lose energy into the black hole and you can match that by computing the absorption cross-section uh, off of a black hole, like, like a rotating black hole, for example, like Kerr black hole and so on. And super radiance will give you an enhancement, and this is a beautiful story as well. Uh, but if you study the, the scattering, so the, the, the scattering cross-section, not the absorption, the, the, the elastic cross-section, then you can match also with effective theory. And it's very easy to see from just the number of derivatives that the effective theory, which is a pawn like uh, we have a term in fact of course we're going to have more terms right we're going to have the point and there's going to be an interaction like this in the m it's going to have interactions like this m plus blah, blah blah so there will be a whole contribution from the m part plus a contribution from the high dimensional operator which will scale with omega to the four in the amplitude because we have four derivatives a square in a cross section so if you go to the cross section you'll see that on dimensional analysis it will have to be an area and you have a term which will be proportional, sorry, that will be proportional this term to omega to the a, r chassis to the a. So at that order, you can match the two and you can read off what the C coefficient is. If this is sufficient to match the theory, then this has to be zero. If this is not sufficient, oh, sorry, I'm, not, I'm pointing, but I'm not pointing. If this is not sufficient, then we need this guy. And therefore we can prove in a gauge invariant manner whether this guy is zero or not. But here we also see the scaling. We also see on dimensional grounds how this guy scale with here the tenth power um it will be the square here will be ce square so the ce will scale with the fifth power of the size divided by g and this is what i was telling you at the beginning with the mass there's a one over g everywhere so the first term should have be gm but gm over g is m and then we have gm to some power over g and that's the r over lambda expansion but there's always a one over g in there so this starts with the fifth power of the size remember this coefficient will be if it's not a it, we do the same but if it's not a black hole then this coefficient is precisely the uv physics that i was telling you in the first lecture it is the number that will tell us about the equation state of a neutron star it is the number that will be the ratio of the scale r over the scale rs actually to the fourth power 
So that is this number here. Now, naively, for a black hole, you will say, well, naturalness, what could this be? It's an operator, this is, this is the naturalist dogma. There is an operator in my theory that has a coefficient. In natural units, and the natural units here are in GM units, for a black hole, you will expect in GM units that the C coefficient will be order one, right? So that this number, that this number here will be order one. And here comes, oh, here I actually wrote what I said before. There's an actually order 1,300, the, the G, um, uh, I, this is G Newton, sorry. The G, um, in GM units, in GM units, this, um, this operator is what tell us, oh, nice, sorry. This operator here, this number, is what tell us about the question of say Newton star, and in fact, this is one of the nice things because in the, this number is large. It's, not, it's a non-trivial correction to the waveforms when you, if you just keep the mass. If you just keep the mass, this is a non-trivial correction, which is an order of a thousand correction. And if you have many, many, many cycles, this could be, this could add up. So it could be that, an important effect. And this is, by the way, how uh, LIGO Virgo did the data analysis and how they constrain uh, this parameter because it has many derivatives. And as, as I will show you in a second, it enters a very high post Newtonian order, but there is a numerical enhancement that allows you to isolate it. And it also enters a high frequency. So after you determine already the masses and the spins and so on, so you can do the data analysis just with that guy by itself. And therefore uh, you, can, you can do much better than, than uh, otherwise because it's a large number. Uh, but in black hole, the case of the black hole zero. So where did the naturalists go? What happened to naturalness? Why, um, why is in the black hole love number not one? And it turns out that it could be one, but not in four dimensions. In GR, in four dimensions, this number is zero. But if you go to six dimensions, actually in five as well, and the reason has to do with this uh, vial decomposition that also applies in five dimensions. It's very easy to see that from the calculation that I told at the beginning, not this calculation. This calculation has not been done yet because we had to go to very high order in the frequency. And this is very difficult to do. But the other calculation in terms of the response has been done. And this calculation is very easy to see why this coefficient is actually zero in four dimensions. If you do this vial decomposition that essentially linearizes the perturbation of the zero zero mode, um, which is the static field that you wanna, uh, you wanna track by studying the static response. But you cannot do that in, si in six dimensions. This vial decomposition doesn't apply anymore. In phi, the in phi, I think it's called the rod decomposition, not the vial decomposition, anyway. But in six dimension, it's not zero. It is order one, as you will naively expect. So there is something funny going on with four dimensions, and this brings me back to Sasha's question, because I've been thinking for a while, trying to bound this guy and understand why four dimensions are special. Why is the love number of a black hole zero? We run into a naturalness problem. We have a dimensional, high dimensional operator interaction with a coefficient a gauge invariant object with a coefficient that should be one in natural units, GM, and is zero in four dimensions, okay? So that's something that we haven't yet uh, fully understood. I mean, GR is telling us this. People might think it's the no hurt theorem, but the no hurt theorem tells us that there is no linear term, that we got rid of the traces, but it doesn't tell us anything about response. It doesn't tell you anything whether the quadruple could be there in a response. And in six dimension is there. Of course, these dimensions, you have the rings and so on. So there is another story here. There's a beautiful GI story here to be understood. From the field theory point of view, uh, it's telling us that might be something deeper about some symmetry of the long distance physics in GR, in actually in the, in the background solutions of GR, of uh, black, on, on black hole solutions that we, we haven't yet understood that could kill the operator E squared from the action. So you don't, you don't have a, the right to, the, to actually write it, okay? But we haven't found that symmetry yet. But let me just briefly tell you and conclude because uh, uh, we are running out of time. How are we gonna tell about this coefficient? Well, there's a deformation of the object because the guy, the companion, it is providing the electric field that deforms it. This back reacts in the motion and also back reacts in the quadrupoles and therefore this affects the waveform. At which order does it affect the waveform? Remember, when we did all this, there is no companion, there is no scale R, there is just lambda bar, there is some perturbation. So there is no post-Newtonian expansion. It enters at fifth order in R over lambda, period. But now you go to the post-Newtonian case, and who is lambda? Well, lambda 
is, is the companion. So this is our lambda. And therefore, a fifth order, sorry, a fifth order in our lambda is v to the 10 because gm over r is v squared. And therefore, it's a fifth post Newtonian order. Okay? So a fifth post Newtonian order, you just start seeing the effects of the tidal deformability. But because this is a thousand for a Newton star, you see it perhaps a little earlier. And perhaps the waveforms that we have right now that we are wrapping up the four post Newtonian order. We haven't even concluded the four post Newtonian order yet. Um, we are missing the flags, but we're getting there. Uh, um, we haven't yet gotten to 5 p.m. So how can we do the tidal love numbers? Because this is large. And we think that if, and, and, and if you do a, a statistical analysis, if it's the only parameter you're gonna scan, assuming you fix the masses and the spin, uh, because otherwise you have a lot of degeneracy, right? But if you did that early on through the spiral, because those guys are early enter, enter, enter earlier, then you can do a posterior on a number which you assume is uh, significantly large. And interestingly, if you could do the same uh, for a black hole, the point is that if you get a posterior around say 300, if you can really rule out zero or not, can you rule out zero, rule out zero? And if you add spin, for example, you cannot rule out zero because of the genesis. If you take a spin out of a neutron star, then you cannot rule out zero. So this actually has, has very little posterior on zero. If we do the same analysis for a black hole, this is how we're gonna discover a new object in the universe. And what could it be? Say you say, so this is what I discovered here. Say you see an object which is bigger than a three solar masses. Say you do this analysis and you rule out zero. So it has a non-zero tidal love number. We live in four dimensions, okay? It's not a Newton star, it's not a GR black hole. What is it? Front page of the New York Times uh, uh, for sure. And then we start asking, can this be dark matter? Can this be, for example, a condensate of light particles or ultra light particles around black hole? And this is the whole story that we've been studying that we call gravitation collider physics, because by going into high precision, into perhaps fifth post Newtonian order and beyond, because you still need to go higher orders to disentangle, because there will be a C1, CE2, you will not know which one is which. So you might need to higher orders by going to high accuracy in the post Newtonian expansion, you might learn about new physics, perhaps even dark matters and new objects in nature. So that is the main motivation for us to go to very high orders in the post Newtonian expansion to precisely study these high dimensional terms in my effective action that know about the UV physics and give us a window into um, perhaps even dark matter, right? And, and, and this I can talk a lot because there's a beautiful story that we wrote. I should have put the, I'll, I'll send the reference. I think I put the reference in the Slack about what can we do with these coefficients and how can we learn about this, this uh, very light particles that could condensate around black hole. So that brings me to what we start next time. This will be our third lecture next. Now we're gonna solve the two-body problem. Now that we know how to study the compact objects themselves and what do we need, we're now gonna go into the two-body problem. We're gonna do exactly the same thing for the binary and we're gonna compute the fluxes, the bindings to get the waveforms and then to read off these parameters of the full, the end story that we need to, um, we need to uh, calculate. And as I just motivate to you, we need to do this um, to very high order. So this, I cannot emphasize enough, even, even even from the point of view of the waveforms, the waveforms are very long and they will be very long if you have low masses. And therefore, if you have a, a, a defacing in the waveforms, which is large, a pi, then you lose it you compare because we have much filtering. And therefore, these, these things which are tiny, they accumulate over a long time, they could generate a large defacing. So not just to study these guys, even for Lisa, Lisa is so good then D phase is a 5 p.m. order. We're dominated by theory right now. And this is like pre-LHC pre tells you that we are dominated by standard model backgrounds because of the future of LISA. So we still need to go to higher orders regardless of whether you believe we're gonna see dark matter or not, or the black hole modifications of GR, et cetera. It's just the LISA is our LHC. And that's maybe why my ERC grant is called LHC to LISA. Because we need to go to high precision, okay? And that's what we're going to do next time. And I think, um, uh, Kiriago is going to kick me out now, right? Uh, well, um, I guess uh, this is a good point to stop, right? It's so, a good point to stop, yes. Yeah. So thank you very much for the very nice lecture. Thank you. Um, are there any questions?
Uh, actually, I wanted to ask one, can I? Yeah, please go ahead. So, uh, well, actually, Sasha also has a question. But so about the uh, lab number in four dimensions, for yes. black hole, you said it's zero. Yes. So it's probably related to your, your the puzzle that you mentioned, but does it basically preclude a possibility of writing down some kind of like dispersion relation in terms of some positive quantity? Yes. Um, uh, but but I wanted to run into some kind of contradiction. In fact, you're right, because if the absorption will enter, <clears throat> and we know the black holes absorb and have a positive absorption cross-section, so the imaginary is positive, then we know the real part is positive, like the kramer kronor relations. And therefore, we will know that the CE had to be positive, right? And I wanted to understand if I could write that expression relation, and I do the matching to GR, and, and it gives me zero, that in that analysis, something must give. And, and since I couldn't really write it down also because I couldn't control the properties at infinity and so on, that's probably what is happening. It's just that you don't understand the, the analytic structure of that amplitude very well, like we do in ENM. And maybe the, you're right, maybe you cannot write the, the unsubstracted expression relation that you would like to write in four dimensions, but then you would like to understand why can I write it in high dimension? Could I run this argument in general and see why four is special? My motivation was trying to understand, do this in D dimension, take the D4 limit and understand what happens in four and five actually, that doesn't happen in six, okay? So that was my motivation. How can we do this in general dimensions and understand why the four dimension is special? A, this vial decomposition is special. B, there is a symmetry in the, that allows you that the Tchaikovsky equation is separable in four dimensions also, that doesn't appear in high dimension. As we know, there's a lot of topology in high dimension too. So could I understand from the point of view of the fact theory, all these features from some kind of wall line symmetry of the operators that, that tells you that in four dimensions, these guys are not there. That was my, my, my thinking. But I'm with you, that would preclude this different partial relation in four dimensions, but not in higher, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Sasha? Yeah, maybe we, we should also postpone this to Slack, but I wanted to understand, uh, you mentioned that there are this important effect which appear at 5 p.m. Uh, so I wanted to understand a little bit better where we are now. When do you think, when we will be at 5 p.m.? Can these things be computed numerically? Is 5 p.m. the final goal or then we will have to do 6 p.m.? So where is it somehow, where are we going here? Can, can, can we get back to that after I tell you how we're doing the calculation? Because right now we are finishing 4 p.m. So mm -hmm. we have the binding part of 4 p.m. Three groups have computing that. Mm -hmm. We don't have the flux part of 4 p.m. yet. Mm -hmm. There is one group, Luke's group, that is computing this, Luke Blanchet. And we, in the fact, in theory, we're slowly getting to the flux problem. We've been working mostly on the binding and spin, but now we're getting to the flux calculations as well. Um, 5 p.m. will take a while. It will be a difficult calculation. So it will take us a, maybe a, a couple of years or more to do a 5 p.m. fluxes. 5 p.m. potentials have been done very recently through the way that I'm going to describe now. But this has to include also contribution for uh, nonlinear tail effects that I will also describe. And those have also been calculated, but it's a, there's a lot of subtleties here between how to incorporate the conservative part of the tails and the dissipative part of the tails and so on. So they, there are some subtleties here that we think we understand, but we need to uh, uh, study a little better to go to 5 p.m. And, and, and higher orders. But we, we have a handle on that. Um, now what's been happening later is that people have understood that maybe new tools from scattering amplitudes can give us post-Minkowskian information, which means we can resum a lot of the p.m. effects at a given order in G Newton. Now remember, because in post-Newtonian, oh, no, no. Uh, because in post-Newtonian, G M over R is D square, factors of G and factors of V are all mixed. So to go to a given PN order, say 5 PN, you need G6. So it's a six loop calculation in G Newton, okay? So it's, it's non-trivial to go to very high orders in, in, uh, in the post-Minkowskian expansion. But the cool thing is that if you go post-Minkowskian, which means you just do power counting in G, but you resum all the velocities, is that include more, more, more accuracy. And now it looks like there is one way in which you, I, 
I have a way to simplify even the calculations in post Minkowski and versus post Newtonian, which might give us all these resum velocity correlations that are given order in G Newton. And so there is hope that maybe we can even advance even faster by killing order G to all Earth in velocity one step at a time. So now we are finishing flags at 4 p.m. We will get in a few years a standard EFT and a standard GR. We will get to 5 p.m. We'll continue doing it this way. Post Minkowskian expansion is getting there, it's carving the space of, of uh, post Newtonian as well by adding all these velocity corrections. And that the question that you might ask is that is this the ultimate frontier? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So this is a very good question because at some point you don't want to continue cranking, you want to understand yeah. the theories, right? We yeah. will probably need 6 p.m. to disentangle some of the, of the, um, uh, uh, um, so we're gonna have the generalities also between spin masses and these lambda parameters and more parameters that appear. So for example, the cheer mass centers are leading order. How do you know the masses, the individual masses? Because the 1 p.m. correction knows about the mass ratio. So you first read the cheer mass at low, at low frequency and as you start getting a deviation because the 1 p.m. effect start to matter, by looking at that deviation, you see the mass ratio. So you measure the mass ratio. Then the spin comes, then the tidal effect comes. And then you start disentangling each one at a time, you need higher orders, right? But at some points we will need to understand how to treat this analytically, how to match analytically into the numerics that do the merger and maybe have a full understanding of the analytic dynamics that could also go into the strongly coupled regime. So this is what the post minkowskian expansion may be doing for us because it resumes all the velocities, it's giving us a hint of how the structure of the solution looks like. We start getting now, for example, elliptic functions. So the four post Minkowskian order, the G4 to all orders in velocity, which is only 3 p.m. if you truncate, but includes a lot of extra velocity effects, we start getting elliptic functions. So this is very interesting because it's telling us what the space of functions that we may start seeing in the full analytic solution, which will be the next frontier. How can we now parameterize the exact solution? For example, this EOV approach that tries to give you an analytic solution of the whole thing by matching into an effective one body approach. It seems to be very phenomenological right now. Perhaps we can understand it more and more analytically by also understanding most of the post Newtonian. We're getting data, post Newtonian data, post Minkowskian data. Can we really understand more and more the non perturbative regime? And this is, I think, it will be the frontier. Understanding the non perturbative regime with a lot of data from PN and PM and numerics. And we start seeing a little bit about the structure of the functions that we get. So it's a beautiful, also mathematical thing. And maybe even trying to guess if this was super gravity, I could even maybe guess what it would look like, what the all PN orders would look like. And this is something that I've been thinking about. Because, for example, you know that in super gravity, you don't get precession. At least, at least not at one loop, uh, which is this paper. Um, uh, um, by Simon and Sarah, uh, which is very interesting. So maybe maybe we can even solve an exact solution, maybe for for uh, the supergravity case. But that's another story. Does that answer your question, Sasha? Yes, thank you. Yes, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> so thanks a lot, uh, Rafael. Uh, so we're uh, running a little ba a bit late. So uh, let's uh, thank uh, Rafael again for his lecture, and uh, we move.